Hello students, welcome to Masterclass, YouTube Masterclass. There are Masterclasses that aren't necessarily YouTube Masterclasses. This functions for Coursera, which we do a promo for because we freely, I, I had taken all the Coursera courses and trained to be a professor at other places, particularly California Institute of the Arts where I hold a PhD. My name is Aaron Sheely. I don't really go by Dr. Sheely except for once in a while, and really the only reason for that is because that seems more like what you would define as a medical doctor. That I'm the doctor of the arts, I only have to know, in fact, theory to an expert form to know what I'm talking about in terms of even cinema aesthetics, let alone the rest of the aesthetics. And what's interesting about that is I make films, so I'm good at what I do in the film criticism, but that I'm not actually a painter kind of makes me wonder, Doctor of the Arts, shouldn't I be able to paint my own images? And that I have painted some pretty good images, even at festivals like Burning Man that were okay and passable as a painting. And the fact that they would even let me at Burning Man make a painting means I'm okay at painting. But what I'm trying to get at is it's not a skill that I've technically devised that I've had, but I can technically devise how they devise painting. So I can actually claim even in the arts that like, diagrams of paintings and how to make them look different from different angles and how the nodule at the bottom adjusts your vision and how you're looking at it from a different angle makes even the Mona Lisa which is small in comparison to how big it's usually shown on even a card I've showed before on one of my shows and I'm just like well I understand what makes a painting great I mean if you look at it and it hypnotizes you and you immediately have sublime bliss you know it's a pretty good painting if you look at it and go into the painting then you're actually looking at the painting the correct way because actually they had called it a scary Stendhal syndrome a trauma movie by Dario Argento that I have to vouch for because I was working for that studio around the time they passed that through their studio and I've passed movies through trauma too and I highly recommend some of their films, and I'm not just saying it to not, like, go on having them boycott mine as though I can just offensively use their high-class trademark, and that's not a joke, because they're high-class Hollywood. I mean, they're already making uh, movies of Toxic Avenger in total uh, reconstructed Hollywood modes, and they're using money, and it's not just the money I've made for them, but at that token that I even mentioned that I made money for them says they're not really against the idea either and that I'm really, you know, they get the fee, the finder's fee themselves, you know, it's not me. I'm selling the film to Troma. They're not buying for me what I could freelance to them and that I keep my credit at all is not of importance, but sometimes it remains there because I'm in the writer's guild. But not that I would waive that on Troma if they wanted to rewrite one of my scripts and use another name or actually write the same script and use one of my name. I have to go by the code of, well, they must have really liked that script, and that's what I did with Ed Wood's Order of the Damned. And I don't want to talk about my own film because it's, although it's significant in terms of it was one of the only films out around the time of the pandemic when every film shut down, that's about the claim to fame I'm not going to go into right now because we're going to do one that was kind of like The Plague, only a weirder thing because it was like The Stranger Meets the Plague. And we're going to skip gears now to the Italian film business in 1945. Now, one thing you've got to understand is at the end of World War II, the Italians actually turned to the side of America at the end of the war in a bipartisan effort to join right and left sides, to join America, to kick out Hitler because Hitler had turned his back on Italy. That's the true history. But that not a lot of people know the Italians turned to the Americans. The reasons they turned are all explained in these films by this director named Roberto Rossellini. Now, what's interesting about Rossellini is throughout his whole career, he made these very realistic films, very realist camp. Were they modern? Yes, they were kind of cinema verite. He didn't know how the film was going to go until he was filming it. But in certain aspects, he knew how it went already somehow and filmed it almost as if it was an actuality, although it was sometimes only days after or a day after or even moments after the event had just happened. He'd have everybody stand up and pretend to recreate it for the movie and as realist as that turned out because that sounds like a really like you're making a ballet out of a dream but he lines it up so realistically with his camera and that it's documentary realism to the tooth is what i like about rossellini and he does that all through his later films that are even in color but i like how these are in black and white now this is the reason 
that Rome turned bipartisan. You see this first of the war trilogy, and I talk about this trilogy in my favorite thing, my favorite trilogies part in film theories. Now, the favorite trilogies, besides trilogies like Star Wars, which isn't a trilogy, there's nine parts in it, plus Rogue One and some Han Solo and some TV shows. So you can't tell me that that's a trilogy, but if it was an original trilogy, the prequel trilogy would almost would be a, a, one of my favorite trilogies, if that could be taken as a trilogy alone. And I, I like how George Lucas directed those trilogies. I like the Orpheus trilogy, the Cavalry trilogy by John Ford, the Apu trilogy, and of course the Trilogy of Life. And now we're at the War trilogy. And they're all taking it to be the best trilogy ever. You know, everybody's going for the three movies that worked out in one genre. And the Star Wars isn't exactly taken out of trilogy range just because you can trilogize it in different aspects doesn't mean one of them wins because all five of them are the great trilogies. The Cavalry trilogy included the John Ford movies about the Cavalry at the Fort Apache. And she's I know Fort Apache is real, real controversial, but this one is controversial too. It's about how Rome was taken over by communists. And when Rome got taken over by communists, they were happy because that's what they wanted. And then next thing you know, Germany is coming in and declaring war on Rome for putting a communist government up, which some of us would think was a good idea, except they were replacing it with national socialism, which really they were all finding out was more of a fascist organization that used power over people to maintain their own power, and it was physical power to be fascist. That they were using physical machinery of war to move these people into their own clutches is not so much that the communists took over with force, they just introduced their idea and were invited in. Now, I know all of us troubled folks from, that lived through the 80s and all the Cold War don't like R Russia, especially right now. So I can't say anything good about communism on the show, and I'm not going to. But the thing is, is the communists were oppressed by the Nazis, and that's not a good thing. And that's not what I'm saying about prejudice is now over communism is somehow Nazi. I'm not saying that at all. Please don't get that. What I'm saying is, is that like the different forms of government that were working right then, somehow, whether you like communism or not, had turned to America and said, if they're going to be executing these communist leaders, we're, tur we're turning on to America. And America opened with welcome arms, their new friend in the fight, who had proven to be a friend in the fight. But all that happened right after this, which is the occupation of Rome. It says we're open, Rome open city, but the irony is, is Germany just occupied it. And now that Germany occupied it, they're taking all the communist leaders and beating them up and killing them. And this just, his movie was filmed like a split second after everything happened. I swear he was coming in to document it. And he had to abrasively make, quickly, like, make this, like, documentary. And it's even more fast than guerrilla cinema because it captures it without a big battle plan. You know, you don't know, he just has a plan in his mind and, that it's not really a battle plan is what I'm saying is, is he has it all sketched out how he's going to film it. That there's no other claim to auteurism that sticks so hard as Rossellini. And Rossellini guides us through the occupation of the city to some people, characters we get to know and like that were based on real characters that were probably their friends and playing them in the movie that there's non-professionals in this as in Robert Bresson, non-professionals. We love how they show so much emotion in this. And it's not fun to watch the guy get beaten. And it looks real. is about a real event. But is actually staged. Not just for the ethics of not letting things of people really get hurt be shown. But also because the way that the war was. Even in Rossellini's case. The war was worse than the devastation shown in the movie. And that's just because we all know from the Civil War movies, things were reduced to wasteland on both sides of the line. And some of it's never come back from that. And that's the ravages of war some documentarian should make and just show that it levels you out when it happens. And they were leveling Rome. And it wasn't, that was the main turner to America that America felt. They had no other choice. Didn't matter to America. They reached out to them, even after they had put up that they would fight them. But there was very little combat between 
the Italians, and the Americans, and once their communist leaders were put into SmackDown by these Nazi guys, they started calling over there. Now, this is the interesting one because it shows the side of the bipartisans and how the Italians had come to both sides, so they weren't just influenced by the left or right wing, but they had to be both left and right wing, and I'd fought for that on Hearts of the World with D.W. Griffith, his, like, assassinate the leader of Germany who's leading all these people to fascism, you know, and then that Griffith would fight in World War II and in World War I, and that he would film some of both of those wars. But his World War II footage wasn't rejected on any grounds that he had a strange political party later. And I'm not going to discuss really why he turned to the left or the right, Griffith, because some leaders of film don't have one or the other political way to turn except for however the tide turns. And they, you know, it wasn't like, but these films here stick up for a certain nationality. And that Paisan sticks up for America is called Paisan means friend in Italian, and they're talking about how America is a friend. You can see his stars from our flag in that picture. And that a bunch of soldiers go to occupied Rome, and they see that it needs clearing. There's five stories that are not cut back and forth from, like Intolerance, but like chapter style, like Tarantino, each one is shown like a book, and that you can see them in four parts, and that one part is about an African-American, American, American the sold American soldier and he finds some a stack of shoes and he's getting a stack of shoes from all these people that had to deposit their clothes to the Germanies and he's trying to hand them back out and they're volunteering and it's kind of confusing. And then there's a tale, and I'm not giving these in exact order, but there's a bishop's tale where they eat with these Jewish guys and they think that they con God consecrates it even though before they're they're you know, they didn't understand what that even meant and they wouldn't like eat with them and now they're going to and it's kind of this tense plot between religions or if you're religious you're like whoa wouldn't they just want to eat with them i mean who wouldn't want to so it's a cool part of the movie because it shows how the politics and religion intertwine and how people treat each other across barrier lines that they've never learned about because the war has certainly shrunk in the world until now everybody knows where everybody is the uh other plot is the beginning one where the uh, American soldiers come to save all those Italian hostages. They save about 30 Italian hostages from being held by soldiers to tell them where the American army is. That they don't tell them and we're totally on the side of the American officers is already showing this bipartisan side. That the soldiers escape with all the hostages intact and get them all out of there is an unprecedented cinematic style that does encapsulate some moments I've heard even from Dr. James at USC. He says, doesn't this film look familiar to our Hollywood territory, even though it's one of those imprint reality movies? That the camera imprints reality is an actuality. Actualities by the Lumiere at the start of film in 1895 are the reason that there are actually documentaries that are filmed as they go, and a movement is already happening when they come in media rest in the middle of the story. Because there is a story to even a train coming into the station, and they should have started it just calling it a train and have a train go by, but then it'd be called a train go by. And that it's an actuality, and that sometimes filming a train is an actuality in a movie, because they actually film an actual train coming through. I have. I filmed a train in one of my movies, and I've tr filmed a train in a couple of movies, and it seems like an actuality because it's actually passing, but that you make it in the film appear at a different time than it passed or that it's passing while you're watching the film is something we think about. Do we think about film in the present time? Maybe the first time we watch a film, we're watching it and thinking, I'm participating in this right now. We're stendhaling it. We're going into the film. But the second time, you're like, I know how this story goes, and this is amazing how it's played out. And if you're showing it to someone else, it's usually the correct thing to do to have them check their perspective on your history of war and your history of movies to see if they're intact. That these movies are intact historically, not just because they're basing them after the moment they happen, also gives you a sense of being right there. And that I exaggerate a bit to admit in honor of 
David James, I do find Hollywood techniques in these films, but that's only like saying because Hollywood film directors were talented. I mean, do we not agree that Hollywood film has some of the best films on earth? It are, always has. And that's okay that everybody based their films on them or off of them. And I see what he's saying, that some people go so far off Hollywood that it's a rule like, you know, with Lars von Trier, do five obstructions and totally bank on cutting all the Hollywood rules out and still making this gritty, wild film, you know, that he can make with all these obstructions that aren't allowed. And that makes sense, you know, that Dogma goes kind of a rebellious way and says, well, we're going to make movies for a lot less that are way better. I liked a lot less for way better, but in America, we do spend money on the things that are expensive, like special effects, and some directors don't have that ability, like myself, to spend all that money that I would, only would be so I could express effects in the way that would draw attention to the film with more people. I don't think there's anything morbidly inhumane about drawing, using effects really beautifully to draw people to a movie. That's why I don't really rag on even like these movies that I don't really like, they're just special effect movies. Usually I'd like to see the human spirit. I like these dogma films that come out. We like all cinema here. We don't bag one over the other. I don't say that commercial film is necessarily bad because it's commercial. I don't do that. Not only because I respect other people's views, and let's be bipartisan like the movie Paisan shows us. Let's just say we're at the end of the movie and our only hope is that the Americans land and come and save us and that we're going to fight for the Americans and prove ourselves is when you see not only that the fascists have been blockaded by these Paisan, these friends, these Americans. They were coming to save these Italian soldiers at the end of Paisan by Rossellini. And it just happened. And the Americans saved the Italians... The Italians save the American. And it's like the movie's calling for everyone to know that America is now on our side because we just fought a battle and now I'm filming these very pivotal movies. And if that doesn't sound pivotal, all the communists that got captured in this by the German soldiers played by all the people that were non-professional but they looked like them, a minute to days after it happened, all assimilated into these war trilogies, you're not going to believe what happens next. First, I got to tell you on Paisan, there's a couple other stories that are told outside of it. And here's a shocker that I wanted you all to know at Harvard about film class that we hadn't talked about. And that is, is we talked about this last master class, but check this out. Every film in its definition that comes out and is released to Criterion and whatever else is not just restored and re-advanced and re-upgraded and put on file with the government and the people and the director and everybody knows about it when it gets that way. And if you see the label, you know it's Criterion. And I've even done some work for the Criterion. The Criterion is a company I work for. A cousin of mine, Dylan, told me about the fact that they were trying to hire me. So I got the job. It was nice of him. But that I directed movies for Criterion is only because they they took one of my shows in and it was a show that we will talk about because it is pivotal in the what happened when COVID hit and who was making movies movement. But my movies weren't like as instantaneous as Rossellini and his were newsworthy and that they didn't really have a newscast and that these were kind of the newscast and that their propaganda, again, we're saying, first we're saying they're like Hollywood in their rigid long takes, like Citizen Kane or like Wizard of Oz has some long takes, and we saw some long takes in Hollywood. So who's got the long takes? I'm sure them. And everybody's been fighting the battle of the long takes. And, you know, my long takes aren't as technical as other long takes, though I've done some pretty technical long takes, but I've seen some way more technical long takes. The long take and intolerance that even gets cut up by boards of what they're saying and what he's showing and that's okay because you measure the time together as though the subtitles intertitles whatever aren't in the way just as though you were reading subtitles to this class which they're subtitling the youtube master class they're subtitling all my songs over at the dead tire riders and poor white trash and i keep building myself and this is the wrong time to do that because the wrong time to do that is to take any glory off the situation we have at hand and that is the war trilogy is just warming up for the last issue, and then I will get a deck of movies and we'll keep talking because this master class is going on for a little while longer. We're going to take you to some other places besides just the interworkings of the war. And so now we're thinking, 
The Americans have joined Italy's side. Now, we can't forget that the Americans were fighting with the French, British, and even Russia. We'll just say, you know, we're not really allowed to talk about Russia going back to that. There's no use of their titles right now. I mean, we can at the Harvard class level, but we don't usually promote things that are at a country that's at war with our allies. And that the allies of the Ukraine don't like this war. I'm going to be political and say, well, then everyone should leave everyone alone. Go home or whatever. Pretend it never happened. Or just, you know, it's not, it's not fun to have to choose sides on a war. But if I'm going to choose, I'll choose with my country. And see, that was the extent that really didn't really take away from what D.W. Griffith was trying to do at the end of his career, and that was somehow rebuild the city of Germany. Now, the story of Germany needing rebuilt only cracked right around 1946. And the thing that's interesting is that Rome Open City is set in 1945, but very soon did it come out after Rome became an open city in 1945. Now, that's what's interesting because Paisan is when the bipartisanship came out and that this was planned as a trilogy to monitor the whole scope of World War II as the Italian side is interesting because they're already getting occupied by Germany by the time they switch to America. But guess who gets bombed, shelled, and defragged by every ally of America, including America, the British, the Russians, and the Russians lost a lot of people in this war. Oliver Stone calculated that the Russians lost... 10 million people, as compared to all the other people that lost people, the Russians lost more of their population, but that they used to be the most populated, and they keep having these hunger problems where they can't get enough food to the people, and their communism keeps failing. But that the Russians laid down their life for many other soldiers that were on our side is kind of, is perfect for history. But for us right now to say, well... The Russians were on our side, but then they turned on us is really what we have to teach because then it became a, a threat to even not teach communism. But just let me say a little break in that, that the school Berkeley teaches communism. I don't really mind when they do that to language and find out what language really means. It's not to me an assumption that it's an insult if you're finding out what a word means, right? We can all play Marxist word games. That is an economic system. I see it flawed, especially when we've been running on capitalism so long. Why would we even change that? What's the point of changing that? To screw everybody's checkbook up and go live in a hut somewhere? I don't really think it would work. And But I can respect the fact that even in Berkeley, with the communism there and the pressure to take that party, and then you find out D.W. Griffiths blacklisted for communism around the time of a movie like Paisan or something, but even later than that, when it was over, the war is over, he's still, D.W. Griffith wasn't posing. And now Berkeley is like, well, I like that. And that because he thinks different, and that means he really did try to change his view because he wasn't always that way, and he hadn't made movies to prove that he had become a Buddhist either. And so all these facts are like kind of in the air and that it's all in the shickle book, but it's all dolled in the fact that he shouldn't have ended with this racist speech. And I said, well, maybe that was in the Freemasons to say that. And I, you got to forgive the Freemasons for everything because they're really cool and they do what they want, but they within boundaries of the law, you see, and they're within the boundary of the law. And if you catch them doing something within the boundary of the law, like cussing or spitting tobacco or something, you kind of just say, well, that's disgusting. Could you use this? And if he does, great. But if he doesn't, you don't really call him out. I'm not saying that. You can call anyone out for being rude. What I'm saying is, is if he's nervous and he doesn't have anywhere to spit, and he's about to spit on the ground, maybe you should offer him your cup. You know, because these guys have usually been veterans or survived something or have a skill of honor. And sometimes these veteran guys seem out of place, but... A lot of these guys remember these things going on in World War II like they happened. Everybody I've consulted that knew World War II said that these are what really happened. Now, about Griffith constructing Germany and that being anti-Semitic, I'm not going to equate the two because not everybody's anti-Semitic in Germany never was, but that anti-Semitism was only promoted because it was illegal not to be. It was kind of in Nietzsche's era. And that 
uh, anti-Semitism comes in different forms, in different ways, I'm going back to the fact that Berkeley's kind of communism is, I know nobody's going to agree with this, but harmless. It's harmless because it conveys a system of beliefs that we live on the energy and natural laws of the earth, that it's so green piecer. I'm okay with it, because it's like, hey, go be, go be that, go be yourself, I'm not going to, that I would outlaw it in economically only as I mean, I would cut it out of the economics, because in the economic field, I don't want to have to weather everything down and give it all away, but then that makes me selfless, I mean selfish, that I want to actually hang on to something, like hanging on to it's going to keep it with me until the day I'm buried, and then if I'm talking about the day I'm buried, then I'm being existential, which could be a lonely emotion, which could be despairing, and then we're talking about what these films are like to watch, the despair, loneliness, isolation of modern war, and if it's classical, it's only in a Citizen Kane sense that the shots are rack-focused, it's deep focus, long take, and there's long takes. That we already saw from Paisan and the scene with the soldiers recreated. It does kind of look like Saving Private Ryan type classical realism, type international institutional mode of representation, the general mode of representation. And these movies are more like institutionalized, modernized versions of representation. That they are institutionalized shows their homages to film, but really opens up a new venue in documentary that's recreated that takes responsibility and says it's a recreation of what happened a few days ago. We just wanted to bring this to your attention. How we made the movie so fast with so much cooperation is because everybody knew what we were trying to stage and how they figured that out is Rossellini's magic because I've never seen anything like it. Now, the third part is Germany year zero. Now, the, the British bomb Germany, almost a completely obliteration, is never really mentioned in these war movies. But that America got involved because Japan, Pearl Harbor was bombed, doesn't answer, is true that they got involved so much that they dropped the atom bomb on Japan for Pearl Harbor and about as many people were killed at both. That didn't make either one of them good, but they had to happen, you know, for this war that was of these calamitous. It was like the fall of the gods, this war. It was like every leader combating to the death and that we had even Russians on our side, the French on our side, and now we've got the Italians on our side. We just go straight for Germany. The rush to kill Hitler's on even. Everybody's going. And... Germany gets bombed down. Now, this is filmed in bombed down Germany a few days after it happened. And what happens is, is everybody's dead in Berlin, basically. It's a whole slaughter of the whole city, except for a few people that they can't band together. The construction has fallen everywhere. It's totally used in the film to look at how these ghettos are used to form around the kid going around the place and looking at this devastated land. There's a kid at the center of the film where they found him. They must have had film rights to use the kid, which is institutional. But the fact that he's like the POV of the film is something that really gets generated here that gets overlooked because the flight of the red balloon or the red balloon or any of these films about this kid going after a balloon, you got to look at Germany Year Zero. Like they filmed that the same way because he's going in this path that the, even if it's a corridor, or a run that the filmmakers are catching up with him and filming what he's doing, sometimes in these long takes and sometimes in these tracking shots. And there's tracking shots in all of these. They're so hidden by the way the format of the, the dialogue and everything is flowing. And that the dialogue is based on real dialogue makes these films seem hauntingly like the real thing. But I've heard from textual references and other sources that the war itself was worse than could be conveyed on camera. That the camera makes it look post-apocalyptic, and because we love Mad Max, doesn't mean that Germany Zero isn't as less profound as, well, we, we won the war, and now we bombed Germany out. And it seems like a problem already that Germany's been destroyed, and it's like, well, it wasn't a problem when they were fighting the war. Now that even Hitler's dead, which is discussed in this film, the war is over, so what do we do? Because we blew up Berlin, should we go fix it? And who put anyone else I brought up earlier and foreshadowed, but D.W. Griffiths, like, I volunteer to go fix Germany.
They're going to think I'm a Nazi if I do this, but it's the only thing I can do to pledge that I'll go back under the House of Un-American Activities Committee to not be called anything but what I am, a Christian. And Christians would help fellow Christians out. And I mean, the whole speech is so notorious because why it always has to be Griffith, even after he fell out of the limelight and wasn't doing anything, somehow at the end of his life, it had to go out with so many mistakes that, that you would count how many movies did he get right? 150. But that, these war trilogies and these other trilogies I've mentioned, like the Orpheus and the Cavalry trilogy and the Trilogy of Life, and is that. In the Star Wars trilogy, the Rome Open City, Paisan, and Germany Year Zero does something perfectly that may be perfect over any other film. That the kid in the film jumps off a building and lands in his death comes as kind of a surprise, although he's running to it the minute he finds out the district he used to live in was bombed out and his parents, after walking miles and miles and miles, were vanquished or something, he's told. That he squirms it, what jumps off, is scary because you're thinking that this looks so real, that how they make that look real, and that they used a special effect and a stunt man to make it look real makes me again think that it's institutionalized more than it's realistic. But, like I was saying, the expert books say these films aren't as realistic, not just as they seem, I'll get to that, but these films aren't as realistic as just propping a camera up, telling everybody in the same spot, crunch together because one thing I did notice is even the long takes connect together like they either have a match on action or match on scene cut that is to say if there's an action going on in the film there'll be another shot of the action moving now that's a Hollywood technique but that they wait so long to do it kind of goes under the idea that they were doing a Hollywood film intentionally because they're elongating their cut to sizes above the Citizen Kane's 15 second length these Cuts are not the longest takes. The longest takes are Ho Shao Shin, the architect of cinema poetry. And Ho Shao Shin makes the longest takes other than like Hitchcock's Rope was the whole movie take. You know, they set up the cameras and the camera to film only in one long take, even though they had to shift negatives, but they really never stopped filming. They had the overlap rope that it was one long take, so there's a, Hitchcock was a long take guy, you know, he could do that too. I like how Rope shows you can do that, but you can do other things. You can do that, and it's the statement that we did it this one time, and if we do it again, which we probably won't, we'll do it differently, so you won't know it. <coughs> You'll have to excuse me, class. The other long takers are Theo Angelopoulos. I saw this movie that he did called The Weeping Meadow, and it was just this long, long walk. In realism, it was Rossellini. Realism, though, you recognize that from Ho Shao Shin, too. This is Rossellini-inspired realism. And the Andre Bazan would go all on and on about Rossellini being the one with the long takes. And, the, you know, uh, other filmmakers from the Italian neorealism period, which is what this is said in his Italian neorealism, is all basing it on contemporary times with non-professional actors in shot that's last longer than any other film in that. Uh, there's other long takers. Uh, Fouillard is a long taker. I like Fouillard's long takes because in the 1915 and 1914, when he was working at the Grand Guignol, he was reading newspapers about these horrible events that were happening in Paris. Now, this is during World War I when Griffith dons his fighter pilot cap and goes off fighting in the war. So now Louis Fouillard comes in to the beginnings of cinema here and we get Louis Fouillard dating back a ways to about 1913, 1912, maybe even in just some documentaries he had made as early as 1907. But I think Fouillard really didn't count his movies started until he made a film about that's about the youth, and it was an interesting film, and there was nothing bad about it, but that he took to making crime films right after, maybe when he started counting his films, because the rest were kind of actualities, documentaries, poetic sentiment, and weren't really forming into films. Then he discovers the style of nailing the camera to the ground so it's stationary and it doesn't wobble, it doesn't catch any slack. But the whole film is deep focus, long tape, because you get the whole frame, and that there's trap doors and things that fall out, and, and vampires hypnotizing people, and vampires 
killing people and that there's all this stuff in it is only awakened even more by the fact that everybody's in the shot doing what they can to either stop the vampires or the vampires stopping them. It's a spy versus spy maze of all these things that are one side and the other and the good are partaking in good. Some of them are betrayed by their own kind and then join back together. And they have these adventures as they're trying to find out who killed their girlfriend and go after the, these detectives, find these vampires. And I won't tell you how it ends, but the Irma Vep is this word that forms vampire if you rearrange the letters. And the vampire has the longest takes because he would nail the camera to the ground, get the deep focus, and just have these, like I said, these trick sets. That he used Melier type trick sets is only because you notice that these people are coming out of the wall and walking with their, you know, their, you can't see them. They're anonymous. You can't tell who they are. That they're gassing people in a big gas chamber like in Batman by Tim Burton. It's wild to think that Fouillard even affected the way we make movies now. Year, almost a hundred years later that Tim Burton used that scene of sleeping gas knocking people out and that totally originated with Fouillard's Le Vampire which is the one I'm talking about, and that he did T-Men, and that he did Phantomas in 1913, which is a revelation, because it's a five-hour movie, and I remember Griffith's Judith of Bethulia was just barely feature length at 50 minutes. That Fouillard made more movies than Griffith is a debate. I've said that Fouillard made more movies than anyone, because he made like 600 films, but that some of them were really short, didn't throw off the fact that his longest movie was that was full length if you counted all the parts in the series, which you usually have to, unless they're not. You can count them, if you combine them and count them as a feature only when they reach 40 minutes and up, you might find that there actually is more Griffith footage that looks pretty good out there than Fouillard. But if you look at some of those Griffith prints and then realize that Griffith made that big racist blunder, and then realize that Griffith kind of steered the thing away, and now people are holding it against him that he went left-wing at the end of his career, even though, and that didn't really affect the fact that he also wanted to legalize marijuana for Louis Armstrong because they fought in a war together. Now we're getting to unsentimental reasons not to like war. And what I like about these films is that they're really the anti-war films because they're trying to stop the war from open city to Paisan, Germany year zero it's this whole let's stop the war and we think America's going to that Germany gets bombed out bombed out and the little kids looking for his his parents this whole movie kind of makes it a depressing movie when he jumps but then you're too busy thinking wow did they film that for real and there's another poetic Italian neorealist named Pasolini who does realist films but now all the realists that came from like the early days of Italian neorealism like Fellini, Visconti, and Antonioni, they're all making films really realistic, like Rossellini, and using these really long takes. And there's other directors that use the long take method. You know, like Fouillard used the long take method. And in Germany Year Zero, Rossellini proves that he can make these long takes, but still make them realistic like in the rest of the war documentary but then we're talking about the artifice being quite a bit that they had to recreate the set of devastation just to look like it did two years earlier is a testament to the cranes and helicopters no i don't know if they were using helicopters i shouldn't have said that 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 totally takes points off my interview but they were recreating the city already in two days and they were building things and building them up and so it's like they couldn't rebuild the city at that point so they were going to uh just put the devastation back down like it was in the film and that they put the devastation back down like it was in the film they totally had recreated the scene and thus it's artifice but people saying it looks like and sounds like really what happened would also say well i remember that shack that got blown up over there was being over there so there was even these like really critical edgy moments where you're sensing that something was revamped and that it was isn't enamored as much by the fact that it captured reality just by taking a shot of what was happening which was a recreation and you can feel that even in these non-professionals and that's why non-professionals work out i use non-professionals we like non-professionals because they, they have no pretensions. And I'm not saying professionals have pretensions. Don't get me wrong there. Because they've suffered and they've died for their art too. But that the non-professionals are going to be okay with knowing they do a film. 
that's going to recreate the present of how they already are, and sometimes they get really good act acting out of that because they're modeling them around realism and that they're real people that exist in these real worlds makes it look more realistic when they're not expressionism but that the sets recreated almost like the shadows of expressionism and Italian neorealism in film noir are often related as a one light setup film noir being like these Italian films I don't disagree that there's artifice in these films. That the artifice are so displayed by non-professionals as not to be the case about the realism coming through, whether these people were cast on the spot at the location it happened, which only seemed to have happened in very few cases in any cinema because they didn't want to remind someone of the war because it would put them in harm's way. Not like our movies today, like Saving Private Ryan, and I'm not saying anything against what a masterpiece Saving Private Ryan is. But the fact that he uh, did put those actors through boot camp is cool. It's cool. We can do that. But World War II just came as such a big problem. And now it was such a big problem worldwide that it's created a problem in cinema that I'm seeing that's bigger than Germany Year Zero. Germany Year Zero's problem is, is Berlin's gone. Now do we want to rebuild it and bring it back and tell it not to go to war with us? And so we... Didn't even tell them not to go to war with us. We just brought it back. And if there was a crew that brought it back, and usually countries that get bombed out get brought back, except for, we all know, Chetnia when it got bombed out, right, in that famous documentary. Nobody rebuilt it. It just kind of, because it's by Three Mile Island or whatever, and they just left it. And that there's some interesting films from their country is already devastation to me going, is that more of Russian devastation? Because every time I think of Russian devastation, I think of how now I have to limit the criticism on Russia, although should I not? Should, but that I have to teach war and peace anyways, like a prospect of this whole absolute process we're going through. And then, like, World War II was so vicious that, like, I, I can respect Steven Spielberg amping it up a notch and making, like, the full metal jacket of, like, you know, World War, of Sands of Iwo Jima. That's cool, you know, and that he's shown soldiers for what they die for and what they would die for. I'm cool with that. And that they had to go through real boot camps, what so makes it so full metal jacket, because you can tell that they've all got some army gristle, and that Tom Hanks would pull off a performance like that. I'm not saying that he's not the everyday guy that would have to fight the war series, because he is the everyday guy. And I'm saying that he fought the war series of Steven Spielberg, which really adds to a point that World War II movies are of interest to all, and that these movies do reflect, especially Germany Year Zero, with a bombed-out German shelter that the Americans are shooting through and getting through. There's some, some of all these movies in all of World War II movies, but if you'll notice, America at the same time was, kind of, was making World War II movies, as I brought up, The Sands of Iwo Jima. Now, here's a trick, tricky one. The Battle of Midway took place in 1946. And if the Battle of Midway took place in 1946, that means in World War II, there was a big... There, I can't come right now. Give me about 20 minutes, please. Sorry about that. I didn't want to interrupt. It was just because she was yelling for me, and I can go the rest of this lecture. Hang on. Okay, we're good. I get yelled at around her sometimes. I tried to remind him I would be doing this, but it's okay. It was my bad. So in Germany, year zero, the Battle of Midway comes in 1943, as we missed about 30 seconds there. And the Battle of Midway is where they take the war as it is, and they, John Ford is in charge of the cameras because John Ford and many other actors and directors and even Elvis are volunteering for World War II. Draft or no draft, I feel the Hollywood would have went. Even in the midst of people starting to call people communists, they still joined together for World War II. That, that was all starting at that time. is all kept under rug swept until later, until the world becomes a free world again. But that's still hard to see today how all people are free, but that Germany is part of the European democracy of the world and that, like, no hard feelings were issued right over the fact that most, that even Germans didn't want the war and that their city was leveled and that so many of them got taken is seen. Here in the Battle of Midway, it's something different. It's after Pearl Harbor. There's an aircraft carrier that's built in America. 
And the aircraft carrier that's built in America has a lot of passengers. Whether John Ford was on the carrier or he was filming from the side, some of the movie comes from both angles. I think he was manning both in a different angle, like maybe manning off a submarine and going the other way. It's hard to determine, but that he sees a submarine roll out, and it seems like a scene from a movie, like they were expendable, does copy this scene, although it also has some Pearl Harbor stuff, and it's a really interesting film that Lindsay Anderson was said was John Ford's most amazing movie is they were expendable, and I've seen it, and it's all battle, battlefront, like Saving Private Ryan at the beginning, and then it's all we saved Hawaii from any more attacks at the end. Whether it leads to the nuclear bomb or not, we don't really adjust to, and um, that's not really important, but that the Battle of Midway has this aircraft carrier go out, and then there's 200 kamikaze planes coming. And I guess in this battle, Akira Kurosawa had come with, either by plane or truck, to see what would happen, or even partake, in some destructive American force that's going to take out the Japanese. Now, you got to understand, halfway through the flight, Akira Kurosawa got it in his command headset that John Ford was over there, and he's going to blow him out of the sky if he even comes down there. But he's begging him to come down there and become an American prisoner so that they can end the war without having killed a cinema master. Check me if this story isn't true. It's hard to find story, but... Um, John Ford doesn't shoot down Kurosawa because even though he launched a film right before this battle called Kurosawa did called The Most Beautiful, it's totally propaganda for why Japan wants, doesn't want Great Britain and America to win the war. That it's a Kurosawa film is so scandalous because there's George Lucas Kurosawa films. We just talked about how family man he is with American graffiti. Well, that anybody's produced Kurosawa's films is because when Japanese finally got bombed out, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they signed a peace treaty with America saying that they'd never go to war with America again. We did help reconstruct some of Japan, but by 1950, when Kurosawa was back to making Japanese movies after being taken prisoner for turning himself in with the Americans, also ratting out the locations of the planes and where they'd be dropping does, in fact, moral compensating values still venerate Kurosawa? Because with Kurosawa, you got to understand, to, escaped all his buddies out when he realized that America was getting tricked on and they were going to throw kamikazes against him, you know. And these kamikaze guys are not to be confused with the Harry Carey of I'm a Samurai without a Master Ronin and I'm sorting it, you know. I'm talking it more like these... These not, and I'm not saying that's noble in Samurai, because in all the Samurai films, they're totally not saying that's noble. It's just the death penalty for them to not have a master when their master dies. But that these kamikazes are about to drop on them, and America, take, according to John Ford, and I know they weren't lying, dude. This was even more actual. It looks like a dream with ballet, like I was saying earlier, but they shoot every plane from the sky. Nobody, No Americans are lost in the battle, as opposed to all the Americans that were critically hurt in Pearl Harbor that were just not even the military base, but the rest of the people they bombed, the houses they bombed. And so all the planes got blown out of the sky. Kurosawa landed his. He went to prison for about a year. They shipped him back to Japan. John Ford and Kurosawa met once and discussed how John Ford was going to make a Kurosawa film and Kurosawa was going to make a John Ford film. That the man who shot Liberty Valance has all courage to remake Rashomon isn't so much how it's told out of sequence, but that it's told by different people within the movie is often forgot that the same story is told twice, and there's more flashbacks than four. In Man Who Shot Liberty Valance isn't really clear because two of the flashbacks look like they're the same flashback. Man Who Shot Liberty Valance is almost like that same Rossellini long take, although we know there were filmmakers... It took longer takes, and Fuyard, Ho Shao Shin, and they do long takes, Theo Angelopoulos. And Rossellini is a long taker, and he does these beautiful images and beautiful things to look at, and that's why some of it's remade. But I don't know about the original question that Dr. James said is, doesn't Paisan kind of look like a Hollywood movie? 
I was like, you know, from a critique of film, I know they're using the Hollywood style as a language because the first film they did was Visconti's Ossessione, and we'll, we've talked about how that means obsession, or even if it doesn't mean obsession, it means we should all be obsessed with the medium of film itself, and that it's the first neo-realist film, but that it's both based on a novel, which none of the other realist films are. They're based on reality or, like, newspaper articles or, like, Paisan and everything. And that reality is based on what you perceive it is, is very generally brought up. But that Visconti's Ossessione starts an obsession for cinema that even like master class teacher Scorsese would say is a obsession, makes you obsessed with movies. Now, Ossessione may mean the postman always rings twice in Italian. I don't really know how to speak Italian, but that it probably means obsession. And then there's probably an American English title over that that says it. I don't know because I saw the Netflix version, the Ossessione. And it's the first Italian neorealism, so these takes are longer. There's more like Orson Welles, like Lady from Shanghai, or like some of this, like, the stranger technique, or even not even that, but a touch of evil, where it's these lenses that are turning into film noir, and then before it can turn into film noir, it's like then we get Fellini's first films, and they're coming out of the Hollywood tradition and kind of escaping reality. So now we go back to Pasolini, who's like, these films are so realistic that they're mythology. They're things that aren't realistic. He's like, we're going to make it real to be not real. We're going to make the not real real. And then he changes that back and forth when he goes to politics. Is see, you got to understand Pasolini was a Catholic, so his movies always have these like Catholic symbolism, not really so much guilt, but how to entertain life like a Catholic. That he was a communist during a time that really was in the modern era in Pasolini's working in the 60s. By then, it was kind of a free motive to do that, although they were looking away from that economic policy. And that's why he was also um, homosexual. And that he was also a poet and a filmmaker. That Pasolini invented a style of looking at the beginning and ending of a shot, a film, which is a single shot, which is camera on, records everything, camera off, stops recording, that's a shot. That is the length of a duration of a shot, is what the camera records, and then plays back in a duration of time between the beginning and end of an actual cut. So, that Rossellini doesn't betray Pasolini but only makes films even more realistic about like these documentary things that are seen on TV in the 60s. In the 60s, it was lackadaisical, and they liked Pasolini's strange take on communism, that communism was somehow a thing in the 60s. It doesn't totally hold true to American film, as we know as Easy Rider, which takes the approach that everything's cool with other views, and that somehow the blacklist is over. I mean, it kind of makes it look like they're on the other side of when the wild one came in and now they're like, the blacklist is over and we're selling free. And then we get killed by the establishment that we don't necessarily try to invade against, but sometimes our actions just go against what people want to have sheltered from the reality of not accepting others, is that there's a reason for human interest in all people, like humanism is always venerated in all these films. And I'm glad that Kurosawa went to the prison camp and went back to Japan a hero because he did spend time in the prison camp, but was a hero for America and not really that mad at, in Japan at him and let him direct movies at his big budget feature length again. And the story doesn't end as good for Pasolini because when he, in 75, he makes this film, it looks too realistic. Everybody today even thinks it's a realistic film. They think that since they captured something that really happened years earlier in Italy, that they were going for the realist film, but it was 30 years later. They thought they captured it too well. It was really like grisly or maybe not as, maybe about as grisly as Schindler's List of a World War II movie. And it's a really effed up movie because you're like, do we have to see what these like fascists were really doing to people? And then it's like, it seems real, you know, and everybody says that real harm comes to people in movies, but they're under a code contract that goes with the whole viability of world cinema being traded to each other, that no one can really come to harm in a film. That doesn't count a stuntman who stubs his toe in a zombie movie where there could even be litigations against that. I'm talking about like that if there's human harm in a movie, they don't show it so that they recreate it 
seems a little controversial. I don't put violence in my movies anymore. I think violence is too is like an expression, not because of realism in my keeping violence out. Not that I've seen anything really violent in reality. But I just keep it out because I think it's like a film trick. I think you have to rely on it with just to, not really to sell the movie, but to show the movie you're going that far. Me, I don't really, in my own movies, I have scary things happen, which already could be like a controversial. But scary and violent usually goes hand in hand, but you'll see with a suspense thriller, there are other ways of being political and psychological, like The Manchurian Candidate has a little bit of violence, but it's not taken as a violent movie like The Wild Bunch, which pledges all these censorships against cinema, because cinema, although they love The Wild Bunch, won't take this as a let's not go too far moment, and they'll take it even further than The Wild Bunch, as we've seen Nobody's taken it further than the Wild Bunch. That it was a capper of what you can do, only eliminated by Dr. Strangelove in its ending of total explosions everywhere. At the end of the movie is again another use of explosions that we love because at the end of Dr. Strangelove, when the world ends, as we've stated, the world didn't end in real life. And when you walked outside the theater after watching all those atom bombs hit, you realized that movies aren't always real. That that movie by Pasolini, I'm going to name the title, it's Solo. Don't watch it really unless you're not squeamish to war movies. And I really mean that with strong caution because it could be the worst experience you've ever had at a movie because of how realistic it makes like some market to saw Dante's Inferno, doesn't it look? And I ain't trying to get graphic here, but that's how the war, that's the one movie I can think was as bad as the war really was. Maybe not, but that's what makes it art because it was as bad as the world really was, that his Catholic, communist, homosexual, and artist side was always coming out. The beginning of a shot and the end of a shot were called the phonemes and the monemes. The phonemes are the first sound made that you hear in the beginning of the shot. The monemes are the second you hear at the end of the shot. That, if you learn that language of film, you can edit a film better than ever and actually concentrate on editing a film by the shot and build the shot with phonemes and monemes. It's a new way to master cut a film that looks institutional, but it still can be recreative. That is so recreative that his final film got the fascist community to rise up and assassinate him. Doesn't mean that you have to be controversial in film to be remembered that he was controversial in film, and it's the reason he died. He's a total legend going out style, like it kind of was when Kubrick died on Eyes Wide Shut. Nobody knew really why it happened, but he was old and he was ready to go and nobody really knew that, so there's controversy around it. And then there's this whole thing where, like, these, you know, directors have died during the making of a movie. And, but to let all that go, Pasolini was remembered for all of his films, fortunately, and his Gospel According to St. Matthew, which is, again, a realistic version of a story that he felt was real, but and it was the story of St. Matthew. And that That's a Catholic film, but everyone loves it in a film class from Christians to non-Christians is because it's a work of art with beautiful music in it, beautiful pictures, beautiful memories, but that Christians are okay with it because it follows the Bible. Not only does it follow the Bible, it follows it as though there's a documentary of the Bible, and though it's realistic, like an Italian neorealist film, you already get the sense that Pasolini's recreating the moment. That some people have criticized the Pasolini one as being extravagant in nature may have to do with Italy's passion play love and how people were coming down from all walks to do the passion play. But that they were doing it so elaborate wasn't too far from how the New Testament makes the whole story of Christ look. In a certain way, there are some lonely moments of the Christ story, and the film does capture Christ's loneliest moment, like when casting the storm out of the sea, because all the apostles woke him up and he needed to sleep. And I'm not getting simple here, but there's one last thing I'd like to say about the War Trilogy, is it's one of those things that everybody gets sacrifices for the cause, no matter what side they fought on, and that's what I kind of like about it, because Germany or Zero kind of shows they sided with the Germans, that if everybody fought on all each other's cause and against each other and everything, the war's over and they all fought valiantly, and this is the re rendition of what went wrong and how we can fix it in the future, and I think that that's the command these 
these this war trilogy has in that like they've sacrificed themselves and Fellini's always making references to the church as though the church can be over redundant but that's what he loves about the over redundancy they go and see these these women go and see these areas of land where they've seen the saint mary in the sky crying you know it's like the superstition is coming out while at the same time that's why they have the religion is for the superstition and you're thinking these are Italian masterpieces that are coming out of a very interesting time out of Visconti and there's also Vittorio De Sica who does his Italian neorealism which is the bicycle thief when we talked a little bit about that last semester I can't go into too much more now even though I'd like to talk more about Vittorio De Sica and some of his films um, we will get to that and we'll get to that. And I just want to seal the deal that the War Trilogy is Jesus. I mean, it's the sacrifice of the church is based on Jesus. And these films are like the Holy Trinity. It's like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can align them, whatever the Father is to you. But what it's not is a degrading of people that people get together. Even some of the Jewish people that were left out for whatever reason can now eat with these like monks at this Catholic place and it's like you bring people together even they're different and that's what america wants and that's what italy italy seeing it once that's political but it's also human emotion and that there's no degrading but even germany is shown as devastated and we all feel sorry for germany how could we feel sorry for germany if they were so horrible to everyone and now we feel sorry for them there's nothing left of berlin so horrors and tragedies of war like war and peace not to use a russian title they bag us into this dead end of what we have to do. And if we die, we're the greatest revered hero in cinema. If we die in the battle, not only are we revered in real life, but revered in cinema, not because we want our soldiers to die, but we know they fought to the end. And people that have lost family, friends, whatever relation, in pen pals in battle, know that they fought for that cause. And Plato... In a republic says that soldiers that fought for the battles for the cause inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think that Jesus would disagree with that. And I'm not going to speak for Jesus on that. But at sometimes movies as daring as the War Trilogy, which certainly Pasolini's were just as daring as, if not a little more, are certainly not to be outruled just because they're controversial. Because in America, these films aren't controversial. They pretty much look at it as the way they happened in a realist and ever so romantic poetic form. I'll see you at next master class. We'll try to bring up Vittorio De Sica and his movie Shoe Shine. We'll talk a little bit about how it uses recreation in the Italian neo realist movement. If we don't get to Shoe Shine next week, you can count on it being post Men always rings twice in editing, but further along the sound cutting of one microphone and a film nor look as well. And Umberto D, of course, I have to talk about by Vittorio Sica because it's his follow-up to Bicycle Thief and it's a really sad story of an old man who walks with his dog toward a city kind of like Germany or Zero, but the city's not really destroyed. And his dog gets lost and at the end of the movie, his dog gets lost again. It's like it's like the worst case of a dog loss. And if you can't but help yourself to cry at a movie about a guy who loses his dog, don't forget to see Umberto D. It's the ultimate example of a guy losing his dog movie. It may be the only one, because I forget what other movies are about that only Umberto D. comes to my mind. And it's the greatest movie about it. But it's so sad, and it's like the most tragic ending. It's more tragic than the robot holocaust in The Matrix, you know. Not more sad than in the devastation of World War II and its Holocaust, which as we can see is still dramatically controversial in how we represent it. Not just because Russians died more than them, but because they, the Israeli race, was almost eliminated by the Germans. And I'm only laughing because that was horrible about the war. We don't get into that much because some countries find it controversial not to kill them as prisoners of war as they had captured them. But I'm not going to intervene my opinion just because I fight for the, the nations that are allied together. And that, like the philosopher Bertrand Russell says, the document John Locke needed was that nations need to band together and that they form the United Nations. I don't really stand for the United Nations, but they do speak for on behalf of who's following the rules. We all know that it's against the rules. 
to target Israelis because they were almost annihilated is something we've used only to our advantage on rare occasions. That I'm all for using that to an advantage doesn't make me like a Zion Kabbalist who follows everything Jewish, just respects the Jewish because they've respected the UN. And for respecting the UN, I think anyone deserves respect even though we don't always agree with the UN. So there's my political piece about why it's okay to use War and Peace, because War and Peace was written hundreds of years ago. And if you think all of a sudden that Russia's problems weren't worse back then, you're wrong. The problems with Russia were worse during the War and Peace era, even though they beat one in the French Revolution. It was so much dismally worse starvation that people were dying left and right. Now, it was worse in World War II because more people died. But think of how many died a hero other than... The fact that about twice as many died from hunger, and that kind of makes you sad about the fact that starvation was a factor, and then you get mad at the fact that they're communists all over again, and then we get really political and we make a movie like Pasolini does and get banned from cinema entirety. Now, actually, that Spielberg doesn't get banned for Schindler's List is cool because a lot of people disagreed that they needed to bring up what really happened at the Holocaust, and that Spielberg didn't bring up everything but most things that happen there is brilliant because now you got a filmmaker who's saying nobody dislikes me or is allowed to because I made all these cool movies. And now he's saying, I hope you like this one too because it's my realistic one about how the Israelis almost got killed off to earth. And then everybody's thinking, whoa, we heard that with the pawnbroker too. And there's these movies about concentration camps that come back and we think Kurosawa's was internment camp probably wasn't as bad, but we've seen Bad Day at Black Rock. So we know that there's Americans fighting to stop the internment camp. Not that that was right when the Kurosawa thing happened. So the accuracies of these stories told from a left or right wing have become kind of binomial or bipartisan in the way the Italians did when they turned to America. That's all the time we have for Masterclass. I'll see you in a few days when we do another part. And I'm glad you joined me today for the War Trilogy.